There are 40 years dividing them. The 8th Army veterans with their families who've come back, and the husbands, mates, officers and men who never left this corner of North Africa. But across those years has stretched unbroken the memory of what they did together once on the road that led to El Alamein. And I tell you what I do remember, Major Russell and the Imarches uh, from where we were, and with a storm lamp in front of us. And when we got off the train in um, Exchange Station, then we had to march across town to um, Lime Street Station, full kit, two kit bags, the lot. And as we got near to Lime Street, I can see him now with the storm lamp in his hand, and I just shouted, your family's going to be here looking for you. But I brightened it up and started singing. And although they had a full march in order, two kit bags, and by this time they were going on the knees with the weight of it, they went into Lime Street Station singing. And of course, some of our families were there waiting for us, you know. And then that was it from Liverpool. That's so we got out and um, went down to Southampton. Got a ferry boat of some description. I think it took us four days to go up the Medi on our own. And um, then we seen all the sand down the side of the Medi. We were wondering what we were coming to. <laughs> They'd come to an anvil of dust that the sun had beaten and tempered between the desert and the sea. It all flies. You get your ration of bread and start to cut it and find it full of beetles. Water, a pint a day each. One of you sacrificed your water, so about four or five could wash in it, so you can make tea with the other drops. Or oh, we've even been pushed. Or you've, you've had some decent water in the radio out of the truck. You've drained it. Put your soapy washing out water back into the tank so you get drink. That water, that pint, was to wash, shave, and make any drink of tea I think you could get out of. So that's why you always shared everything. If you find there's no cigarettes getting up, one chap might have one cigarette and he would never hesitate to break it into about three and share it around. That is the comradeship of the 8th Army. As we hit that coast road, our memories came back, and I think a lot will be choked today and tomorrow. Remembering perhaps the days they waited together, the brave but baffled Desert Army, as someone at the time described them. You had to fight the scenes, the wind, the thirst, and everything else, but heat of this sun, lag it up, spread your, your ground sheet across the tank or your wagon, and a shade, it was all fighting the desert. It was all that colour, or colour sand, with the wind and the sand, flying everybody with that colour. You all forces. But that was, won't be any think about it at the time we were going through, that was only a minor consideration. The main consideration was the jerry and the jacks, I hope they're older. They were far worse enemies than the weather. And of all the enemies, the most feared and the most respected was Erwin Rommel. As we moved into action, I remember only too distinctly seeing a, a big placard in Cairo which said, Rommel is coming. And for young soldiers who hadn't been in action before, it was uh, rather frightening. And particularly frightening for an 8th Army that in the months before Alamein had been hounded across 600 miles of North Africa by Rommel's disciplined mobile force. Now, though, on the eve of another battle, there was a new confidence in the Allied forces. We've been oh, oh, well briefed, I yes. think, what oh, yeah, was going yeah. to happen. Monty yes. had said Monty there was no was... going back. No. It was the final position. We were, under no account do we go back. <laughs> it was a marvellous it was a marvellous experience to take part in that barrage. It went on for about three or four hours, I think. 
and we had to st only stop firing when the gun barrels became red hot. It was about 900 guns went off. So, goodness knows what Jerry felt like on the end of it. It must have been really frightening for him. It was like, we were never shelled as bad as what he was. And it was bad enough for us then, but God knows what it was like for him. They, they shipped me back to a, a field dressing station. On we was on stretchers for about three days near the rail, railway, about 15, 20 miles back. And the barriers that you, you speak of, the vibration uh, shook the legs of the stretchers down in the yeah. sand. Uh, they, it was just as though the horizon was on fire. There was a one solid mass of fire, as far as you could see. Uh, starting with the bombing, and then after the bombing, they, they went on to the, 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 the guns. And then the infantry went in, the, I think it was the, uh, it was one of the island division in here. And, and you could hear the, the bagpipes, the single bagpipe with them. I have a lot of noise. Awful fear. Shaking. Crashing bang, one waiting to go on action. The minefields in didn't panic because you know what you're doing. So. But when that thousand guns opened up behind us, it started to throw shells over our heads ahead of us. That's our fear, noise. Biden fear. I wasn't a man. I wasn't a man, the British. No, I don't even manage German. There's not no soldier, no soldier telling you when the guns back, and there's nothing to do. Fear. Fear of future. Waiting. But once you go into action, start to move, that fear leaves you. You get a fear now and again when friends get killed by a shell, and you think, God, I could be next. But then you're pushing ahead. But abiding the fear and nerves, noise, crashing. But the drill is yet, you're going one thing, you're going ahead, that's it, you're going ahead. And you go ahead. And that's why you. <coughs> As our interpreter and guide, Cooper said, why? I said, well, you went to go into war, the British, they've always got to win. Well, we never let anybody get the best of us. They might get us down, but we always come back again. The sand's blown in over the lines of battle, obscured the old divisions. A young Italian boy lays a wreath on the British memorial. and even the first-hand experiences have softened with time. The one thing I, I can always remember, which, which uh, I've seen quoted, is that Alamein was the first British victory. Alamein wasn't the first British victory, because we had Wavell in the beginning with 30,000, and we, we had very, very bad equipment, obsolete. And when we went to up, we defeated Graziani's Italian army, complete. I can see a bloke there now, and I'll name him Shuttleworth. Coming up with a tin hat on, his rifle on his shoulder, and about a thousand prisoners at the back of him. And he's coming down, and we see him, we started laughing at him. He was a bit of a character, you know, and he's saying, ice cream, ice cream. <laughs> and there's all the ice ice falling on down below. What the hell did we fight over? Well, fought over. As we don't see no good reason, but no one man as he is today, there'll always be. You've got it now, haven't you? You've got people fighting for power, people fighting for power, and of course, wars. And the people who take part in the wars is you and I. Well, at the time, they were enemy. Let's be honest about it. But, you know, like myself, I didn't want to go to war. I didn't want to be involved in, in taking anyone's life or maiming them for life. And there were, um, I would say that the majority of people who went to war were the same. In the first two days of the battle, there were more than 6,000 Allied casualties. Many, like Edna Shaw's husband, swept away in the first attacks. I always knew that 
I would get here sometime, but I didn't know when. But now I feel I've made it, and I'm really proud. Uh, I, I don't think you can uh, sort of see them grow old, not like yourself. But uh, it's always in my mind. I feel as if I want to stand on the ground where he's actually there. And then uh, I, I feel as if I'm with him. He was the most kind man, and uh, I thought the world of him. I would give my life for him. There were 13 and a half thousand Allied casualties in the 15 days of El Alamein's close fighting. Perhaps 20,000 German and Italian troops killed or injured. And all of them set out with the belief that they'd survive. The first air raid, we had our various positions. And I was under one corner. There was like four towers in the place, and I was under one corner. And after, during the course of the raid, there was uh, the various lumps of shrapnel coming down. And after the raid, I stepped out into the open, and I picked up a lump of shrapnel, and it had 7265 on, and that was the first four numbers of my number and I knew then I would survive the war. It was their replacement commander Montgomery that inspired much of the confidence in these men. His own unshakable belief in victory rubbed off, created a new loyalty and at times quite literally a new image of Monty. And during those days with the old bits of paint, he used to have a paint in camouflage and things like that, he mixed up his paints and cut a piece of a cover of a truck and he painted our general, Montgomery. And this painting I've carried after Alamein right the way through the desert. I kept it all the time and it went right through up into Italy during the battles of Italy. I unfortunately I got wounded, but I still managed to hold this painting. And and this is our painting. Now, when you look on the back, the chaps here will recognise the old canvas hoods of the trucks and the old desert camouflage colours. And after all them years, I never thought it would come back to Alamein after 40 years. And that's our great general. We thought a lot of Montgomery. He did tell us what was going on and secondly it is nothing to see him come up in the line and hand out any newspapers or books for any of the chaps as far as a soul he was a great bloke but he's a, he was a uh, very religious and uh, i've seen him two or three times because i was in i was in the hq where he was in but uh, he, he wasn't too allowed drinking as if he, if he could help it and he, and he cut down his rations he used to have about a pint a month he cut down to half a pint, and the cigarettes as well. We, we used to get cigarettes, used to give them, but there the, the, the was wrong rations. The cigarettes he used to give us. He didn't like smoking either? No. He didn't, he didn't uh, but believe in any kind of enjoyment, I don't think. When you come up today and see this lot, it just makes you wonder how you existed. And I'm very proud that I've managed to get along today. Proud to remember their achievements at El Alamein, even though 40 years have changed the perspective of the victory for many of them. What we see in the world today and what was happening at the time of Alamein, I think the price was too high. We just paid a little bit too high. Possibly I say it with hindsight, but when you look back, that is my convictions. And when you look around the cemetery and 
can see very few over 29 years of age. It's a terrible loss of young life. Isn't it? The, the, uh, the flower of the country, of our, of our own country, went. Uh, I mean, I was so terribly moved when I've been looking forward to coming for yeah. many, many years. And it's a terribly moving occasion, I think, for those of us who were here and lost friends and colleagues and talking about a high price, well, there can't be too high a price, can there, in wartime? I mean, you've, well, not you're committed, time, no. to, uh, committed to one policy or another, and you've got to see yeah. it through, whatever the cost. And I think those who've gone would really agree with that. I think our sense of values have changed somewhat since those days. I think we need to ask ourselves what would have happened if there hadn't been stopped here. The cost would have been very, very much higher in the end, I feel. It was a cost in young lives that old men can share by their informal ceremony of remembrance back on the battlefield. We give thee humble and sincere thanks, O merciful God, for the lives and examples of thy servants who fought on the land, on the sea, and in the air in the Western Desert campaigns of the last war. We thank thee for their ready response to the call of their country, for their courage and cheerfulness in the midst of hardships and danger, for the steadfastness and self-sacrifice in the hour of death. Grant unto them, O Lord, joy and peace and greater opportunities for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Last post and Rivali, the twin symbols of death and resurrection for generations of military men. For the benefit of those who are here now, it's only a little story, uh, and it's a true one. But um, Jimmy got wounded up here, and he got out to, um, he got out the crane, out of the uh, tank, and uh, his driver got hold of me. Anyway, you can tell the story, Jim. <coughs> well, actually, I was the only survivor of the tank, and uh, the driver and the rest of the crew were buried over there somewhere, you know, and. Uh, it's a sent sentimental journey, really. I like to come back and go over and pay my respects. That's about it. He didn't tell you the full story. Actually, he was knocked out and wounded, and he was lying over the <coughs> top of his turret, and it was his driver that shook him out. He woke him up, and he didn't know where he was, but his driver woke him up and shook him out. Jimmy, Jimmy, hey, Jimmy, Jimmy. Didn't get sad in them days, you rang. Jimmy, Jimmy. And then he got Jimmy out, and... Yeah. They made for the first foxhole, and they made for we're going to make for another one, and they got Jimmy around, and then and then he was shot by a German sniper, and that was his driver, Keel. That's, that left Jimmy as the sole survivor of that tank. Right, can we have a look at them three now? It's Sam Keel, that's Jimmy's driver. There, um, young Courtney there. So we say. There's three of them. There. Can you get back there, Jim? We will do the three. We'll be family there, yeah. the three of them there. And these are all of our own, our um, own regiment. These are our own units, the three of them. Mm -hmm. um, if we can name them, it's Sankey and Courtney. Courtney, Left Charity Valley. And that's them. So, men. Good luck, boys. Sorry? Sure. Good luck sure. in heaven. In heaven.
what have, what have been your feelings this morning? Oh, well, I have found this coop. I found him up there. Coop, there's no coop, two ways. Just came in, just into it. You know, anyway, up the, 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 the age, you know, at the, we were at that particular time, like 23, 25 and so on, you know. One's for shooting the coop. <laughs> the other one for playing football. Now, there are various things here. The British here, there's a police medal here, as a matter of fact. 25 years in the police force. Uh, Allied Cross, Franklin, and Belgium, Patton. And there we go, and the Dunkirk Patton. So, seen a bit of service around the <laughs> More than 20 countries sent representatives to mark this 40th anniversary of Alamein. What looks like an old-time Commonwealth garden party in the desert to honor the Australians and Maoris, the Sikhs and South Africans who died alongside their British allies during those few weeks in 1942. The lament of a piper on loan from the Egyptian army unites them in a common memory. Friends departed and courage not forgotten. The men of Alamein fall easily into old habits, the old deference to authority of a generation ago. They pay their respects quietly at the back of the crowd. while from a more recent alliance, the German ambassador lays a wreath to former adversaries. And the Eighth Army veterans themselves, straight, proud men, pay their tribute simply on behalf of more than 5,000 families. Once again, their standard is at El Alamein, a salute to absent friends. And at the end of their pilgrimage to Egypt, the old soldiers and the widows of a war half a lifetime ago go home somehow reassured. They hadn't forgotten, and they know they never will. Oh, it's been a very moving occasion. It's. Uh... Well, quite frankly, I feel drained. I do. I feel absolutely shattered. I think it was a marvellous turnout, and uh, I have a slight feeling there were a few tears shed. I'm not saying whether I shed any or not, because I'm a hard-bitten old swine. We say hello again. They wouldn't let you go. There were new, unexpected tributes and friendships with the old enemy, the men of the Africa Corps. All right, very good. Good luck to you, and go back. Good, with good luck at your home, you know. And we never will be enemies. We shouldn't be. Never again. Never again. Seen enough war. We had enough from the bloody desert, isn't it? That's enough. Yes, that's right. That is right. Thank you very much, sir. And at the end of the day, there was above all else mutual respect between these soldiers. Men who fought bravely at El Alamein 40 years ago, in a battle that changed the course of the Second World War.